So, you're thinking about running a game. Congratulations. What are some things that you can avoid, uh, think about, and implement in your game to make sure that you and your players have the best experience possible? I plan on talking about that in today's video. Stay tuned. As I've said in previous videos, I plan on running either a Call of Cthulhu game or a basic fantasy RPG game. And I kind of, every day I go back and forth between which game I want to run. Call of Cthulhu, basic fantasy, um, do some investigative, cosmic horror, Lovecraftian sort of story, or uh, something more old school with basic fantasy. So for this video, I want to talk about basic fantasy and running a game in that system and I've already kind of set up a, a game that I'm going to run and so I want to explain how I'm setting it up and the kind of plan I, I, I plan to follow in order to run my game and hopefully give my players a really cool old school gaming experience. And again this is coming from someone who's never really, I never get my start in old school but doing my research and reading through the basic fantasy material. Uh, I've kind of come up with a plan and talking to some friends that did play basic expert D&D uh, &D back in the day getting their their uh, opinion on the subject and on basic fantasy uh, I've kind of come up with a plan and things that I want to do and I also wanted to make this video for people that are looking to get into world building for their games maybe you don't want to do the Forgotten Realms or the the already set up worlds that are out there which is fine uh, I admire that. That's what I do. I generally like to run games in worlds that I created. But you're not writing a novel. You're not writing a story. You're doing a collaborative storytelling experience with your players. They are just as important and they are guiding the world just as much as you are. And so for me, there's a tendency to overcreate in my world and do things that. Uh, and make make plot points, make things that just don't matter, that are never going to appear that in the game. The players are going to never see it. They ignore it. They never catch on, uh, or they just straight up murder that thing or person or character. And this whole thing that I had planned is now out the window, and I gotta adjust or figure something out. So, what are some things to avoid when constructing or planning out a campaign or a game? I would say overly complex storylines. Kind of leave room and basic fantasy. These old school OSR games do a really good job of sandbox games. And I think if you're going to do one of these OSRs, doing a sandbox game is the way to go. You need to ditch the idea that you're going to have some grand story to tell. These are all about dungeon crawling. It's about killing things, taking their stuff. Uh, and you can actually implement a story around that, but the fun part as a DM for me is going to be, and, and I've done this in the past with 5th edition, is improvising. Uh, oh, you know, the players did something I didn't expect, or even going into a session with really no plan at all, uh, because you are kind of given up because the players are uh, doing things that you didn't expect at all. And so... Going in with with zero plan and improvising on the fly, making encounters and all that kind of stuff, is part of the fun for as a DM for me at least. And basic fantasy, and the reason why if if this is the game I run next after Adventures in Middle Earth, this is going, th this system works really well as a dungeon master for imp improvising because the rules are very light. It's a rules light system. These older systems were a lot more simple in a lot of different ways, and I like that. So, why? What, what are things that you can avoid? Again, overly complex storylines. Don't plan out like this three-act story that, you know, you're going to end up rail railroading your players and they're not going to particularly enjoy that. So I recommend maybe having a loose structure. Um, maybe you know that there's certain events that you definitely want to happen and that's okay. You really want this encounter with this faction to occur. Cool. The tricky part is going to be, when is that happening, how is that happening, where is it happening? And you're going to probably have to do some improvising with that. Uh, overly complex politics. I had this problem in many of my games, uh, where there's this political intrigue, and I just, 
my players personally just aren't interested in that. Uh, an overly complex political game. And I know that those games out there exist, but I don't think that that kind of game is generally what everyone what comes to mind when everyone thinks of tabletop role-playing. They think of dungeon crawling, fighting monsters, and adventure. And so that's the kind of game that I'm looking to run, and that's where my tastes kind of lie anyways. But in the beginning, I tried to do these grand... I wanted to be a storyteller and tell these these grand stories of political intrigue. And honestly, you end up just being George Lucas in The Phantom Menace, right? Where the first intro of the movie, they're talking about trade federation deals, and then you have 45 minutes of people voting in the Galactic Senate. Your players are not interested in that. I guarantee it. Unless you specifically say, I'm running a political game, and they're down with that, and they're cool, they're cool with that, uh, don't do it, because they're going to get bored. And then that's when you get the murder hobos coming out, and you, they just start killing NPCs because they're bored. And they're not, they, they want to see action, and so they're killing, they're, they're becoming murder hobos in order to, to make action occur in the game. Because you as the DM or the GM are, are not doing that. You're not making it action-packed for them, which is clearly what they want. Again, if, if the players go in with the expectation that this is going to be a slow-burn political game, there's going to be political intrigue and espionage and all these sorts of things, heavy on role-play, well, cool. They're going to probably have a good time because they go in, in expecting that. For me, when I started out, my players were not going into it with that. They were going into it with, we're going to crawl through dungeons and kill stuff. Why are we talking to this nobleman about... Uh, the backstabbing plan that he has to, you know, usurp the throne or something like that. This is dumb. I want to go in those caves over there, and I want to kill the goblins and take their treasure. So, overly complex politics. Unless your players are in on it, I don't recommend it at all. Useless world-building details. I would avoid avoid this as well. Um, things like, I, I would do things like, what's the population of the, uh, the this, this town that they're in? How many people live here? Um, and I plan this out in my in my little notebook. Uh, where does the blacksmith? Where is he exactly in on on this town map that I drew that the players don't even care about? Uh, random customs of the world that the players are generally not going to interact with. So like, oh, in this world, like they eat this kind of food and it's it's a faux pas if you do this at the dinner table and marriages are like this like you can make that up when you get to it you can try and find something cool when players are maybe get getting to that that point maybe they're going to retire their characters or there's um going to be some downtime where they're going to take a season off for adventuring and so you're going to let them do some kind of like a pulled back perspective sort of role play and maybe some of the characters want to marry and start having kids or something like that, you know. You can figure that out when you get to that point, but don't waste your time uh, planning that kind of stuff out when there's a high probability that a lot of these little intricacies of your world are never going to be seen. And that goes with providing detail about your world, but not overly explaining everything to them. You don't want to spend most of the game talking at your players. You want it to have a good back and forth with them, where they're influencing the game world just as much as you're describing it and presenting it to them. Again, this is communal storytelling we're doing here. We're not, they're not sitting here and listening to you tell a story. If they want to do that, they can go listen to an audiobook or watch a movie or something like that. So overly complex customs and just random world details. I would also say overly complex dungeons. Um, don't unless I take it back overly complex dungeons are cool and you can have them in your world and you can probably plop them down anywhere but more often than not you're going to have players uh, sort of avoid most of the things that you put in your dungeon and in, in that instance I would suggest that you put in a hook where you want them to continually come back you encourage them to come back to this dungeon and explore more parts see more rooms if you have this like massive sprawling dungeon that when they go in they maybe find some loot but there's hints that there's could be more in here so yeah they gotta take what they can carry get out of the dungeon to lick their wounds but maybe they can come back at a future date when they're stronger or better prepared or uh, they're just looking for more things to do and they can, can ex explore areas of the dungeon that they haven't seen yet. Most people don't do that, though, in my experience. 
uh, and I haven't done that. I, when I was starting out, I didn't do that sort of thing. I'd make this big complex dungeon and then I'd get disappointed, and this is my fault, 100% my fault. I'd get disappointed when the players didn't want to explore every inch of that dungeon. They wanted to get in and out for whatever objective they're in there for, or if they found a cool piece of treasure, and they were not interested in 50% of the rest of the dungeon, or 90% of the rest of the dungeon. You know, they took a beeline straight for where they're going, and um, went straight for that. And so, and so... You, you have to if you're gonna have overly complex dungeons I think that you need to have that hook in there where you're gonna want the players to come back and visit this location repeatedly and explore it more every every once in a while um, as their characters maybe get, again get stronger and whatnot what are thing what are things to do uh, how do the PCs meet that's always the biggest one and I don't think that you should feel ashamed of saying everyone meets in a tavern that's a perfectly acceptable uh, way of meeting, especially in a fantasy world, and especially when you're running an OSR. When you're running an OSR, you know, that's totally within the flavor of that. Um, but you need, but if that's, if, if you do feel ashamed of doing that, and you want to have a more interesting way of, of, um, of having them meet, perhaps have them all appear on the same, uh, in the same prison, in the same slave ship. Maybe they're traveling in a caravan, and you can give them a prompt. I think the key to making the group meet together and, and stick together is make them maybe want to be part of an organization, they're searching, make it part of character creation where you have a specific thing like, look, you can make any character you want, but they need to be all from this kingdom, they need to be from this region, from this area, so that maybe they're all invested in that region and what goes on there, and that's why they're working together to do the things that they do. Maybe they're all of the same religion. You know, maybe all of you worship the same deity, and so that's why you're together. You're, you're working together, because um, then you can have like maybe an opposing cult to, their, to the, the religion that they have. And maybe they have like a more mainstream religion, you know, that's more widely accepted. And then there's this evil, nefarious cult that's always been their arch nemesis of this religion. And so the players are members of this more mainstream religion, and they're always being harassed by this cult that's trying to wreak havoc in the world. Having, having things like that, that's perfectly fine. But again, don't worry about having them meet in a tavern. That's perfectly fine. You can totally do that. Um, maps. These are. Th I think it's important to have a map, and I'm going to show you two two maps that I've made. So this first map is one of the first maps I made for one an earlier campaign, and I'm really proud of it still because it was a fun map to draw. I'm an artist. I do a lot of freelance art for tabletop RPGs, um, various ones, and and so I mean that's partly partly where my love comes from is that I do illustrations for games <coughs> but um, I think a map is important as a DM as a GM uh, to kind of ground the players and let them know where they're at in the world all right so for this first map though it's a map that I made that um, it was an, an earlier campaign it was a world crawling adventure lots of like portal hopping and stuff like that high fantasy kind of stuff and honestly, they barely used any of the map still. So, this massive thing here, this massive, massive map. And the cool thing about this, if you want to steal this idea, it's totally fine. I put it in a poster board, and you can actually, uh, it's upside down, I'm stupid. Uh, it, I put it in a, in a poster frame, and it has like this plastic over it. And you could actually draw on it with a dry erase marker, so I could like, draw on here of all the places they'd been and in that game it started up here in this continent uh, they then took a portal to this one which is where like the mages guild lived and then they ended up over here and just like uh, the this this little part here totally useless that I, I built this whole thing like they used a fraction of this one city on here and one city over here for that whole campaign and that was like a six month campaign they spent most of their time over here and then 
towards the climax of the adventure, uh, portal hopped here and then portal hopped here um, with the help of some high, po very powerful wizards. And so I guess it worked, but I probably could have gotten away with just making a map of this. And I didn't need any of this. I could have just explained that you're at this place that's east of where you started. You're further east. So, pretty much, I mean, I'm proud of that map that I made, and I might, I may use it for future adventures that want that I want to take place in that world. But, um, my new map that I'm using for this uh, basic fantasy game is a little hand-drawn one here in my book here. And it's much smaller. It's probably about 100 square miles uh, in comparison to like a whole world. That's that's uh, purposely bringing it back for me, you know. Um, but this, this little map here, and I'm going to probably have the players start on this, this town here. So there, there's like three, only three massive towns here. This one, Iron Haven, Creighton, and Nair Badahir, or and, and Meleth. There's four. And in my lore, like these Iron Haven and Creighton are two human like city states with kings almost that have like they rule like the providence around it. And Meleth is where the elves live in their wooded area, and Nair Badahir is uh, where the dwarves live in the mountains. That's all I needed. Uh, I didn't need this massive world because honestly, there's going to be plenty for players to do roaming around this world. Um, you need to come up with deities. I think in one of the core classes, there's only four classes in basic fantasy fighter, thief, cleric, and um, magic user. And so clerics need a god to worship. So I think it's important to um, look through deities maybe in mythology or make up your own or use the official what I, what I ended up doing is um, I use the official um, here in my little game master journal I use just the official uh, gods from the D&D &D universe from the official Forgotten Realms so Bahamut, Asmodeus and I, I just picked and choose ones that I thought would be relevant to the world uh, Moradin, Vecna, uh, Pelor, and, you know, I add my own little spin to them, um, but it's just easier than, I, I find it kind of silly to pick, like, I'm gonna use Norse mythology, it's just not to my taste, especially if I'm not running, like, a Norse, if I'm running a Norse-themed game where they're, it's taking place in real, real places, like in Nordic, uh, lands, I'll use Nordic gods, but, it just seems weird to me that that they exist in this made-up world that I'm I've created. Um, one thing you can do is take real gods from history, from ancient religions, and just reskin them as how how you see fit. Look at Egyptian gods. Egyptian mythology is super interesting. Um, look at Egyptian gods and and reskin them how you want. Uh, all all that is perfectly, I think, fine and acceptable. But regardless, you need gods for your clerics to worship and to invoke. They have holy symbols. I made the mistake of starting the game once, and I hadn't thought about gods. And so the, there was there was a paladin in the game, and he was like, "Who who do I worship?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Who do you want to worship?" And thankfully, you know, D and D comes with the the gods in the book. The thing with basic fantasy is that basic fantasy does not come with deities. It just assumes that you're going to pick something uh, to your own tastes and liking. There's no... There's clerics in here, and they have holy symbols, and they have these spells, but they don't have gods listed in here. There's no theology for your world in this. So that's important. Uh, are there any evil and secret cults in your world? That's also important. Because those these can be potential enemies. Again, I, I talked about this uh, concept of all the player characters are part of the same religion, and they're in opposition to this evil secret cult. In my game, uh, I have a couple different cults. I try to just make a few, and uh, let's see if I can find them in here in my little DM journal. And 
I have one cult called the the Goat Mother with a Thousand Young, and this is taken from uh, to the uh, Lovecraftian mythos. But I reskinned one of Lovecraft's deities and named it Tooled Cool, and uh, they pretty much have like shog shogoths and all these sorts of things, and um, they they worship this uh, fertility deity, and they give their members, the chosen few, uh, something called mother's milk, and it's this gross, milky, you know, pussy substance, and when a follower drinks it, if they are chosen by told coal, they will turn into this, you know, horrible, gelatinous sort of creature, like what I've drawn here in my little notebook, um, and, you know, they'll serve their god, um, for the, forever, pretty much, as this hideous mutated monster or they simply turn into the hideous mass of mutated flesh and die and so um, they oftentimes will kidnap people and use them as sacrifice to told coal or perhaps someone is chosen by told coal and they don't know it but the cult knows it so they need to cap kidnap someone in order to give them the mother's milk and turn them into this hideous monster to serve their god because They've been chosen by Told Cole. They've been given this great gift, and so it's their, uh, it's their privilege, even if they don't realize it, to be uh, accepted into it. I also have the cult of the Hidden King, and this is a cult that worships a previously long dead um, race of men. I'm taking this from Tolkien now, like the Numenorians, uh, who started good and used the wisdom of the gods to their advantage and to gain power, wealth, uh, and to feed their greed as time went on, and this caused the gods to wipe them out. But there are those within it that became liches, uh, and that was partly what they used the, the wisdom of the gods for, is to fight death. They didn't want to die anymore, they were tired of dying. And so the cult of the Hidden King wor worships a, a great lich. And there's ties within this cult to Vecna and all these other sorts of things. And um, um, they worship Vecna and this hidden king. And this hidden king is a lich who is, you know, like 10,000 years old from this previous long gone civilization. And uh, they seek salvation to, and, and to defeat death through the worship of this hidden king and through seeking knowledge from Vecna. So that's that's my cult in there. So these are all like potential enemies that can be ran into the by the player characters. And you know, um, I used to try and make like a, a main villain, like who is this main villain gonna be in my story? And it was funny in the game where I, I ran this one over here where they were they were fighting lizard people pretty much. Um, a, a serpent god, serpent uh, woman who could like uh, shapeshift and whatnot, and the players were kind of like, yeah, 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 whatever, those guys are, whatever, that cult is cool, and that villain is cool, but they were more interested in this kind of, like, side villain that I made, who operated a cult to Osm this god I made called Osmodial, who is this void god, and this cult was were like death knights, and they had swords, and the blades of the swords were like black, the blackest black. And uh, when struck with these swords, if if a certain roll was made, if a certain number was hit, or on a crit, I think it was on a crit, it was an instant kill, and you were sucked into the void through the sword because the sword is made out of like the void. And so this became a much more interesting <laughs> enemy to my player characters. And so I kind of, I only meant them as like a one-off kind of thing, but I kept bringing them back because my players really enjoyed fighting these guys. And um, and so you kind of got to leave room for that in your games, and that's why I caution against overly complex storylines and politics because the players are going to maybe bring the story in a direction that you didn't expect, and it's going to be a lot cooler than what you had planned. And the rivalry my player characters had with this cult of Osmodial, the Void Knights as they were called, was much better. And it was funny too because I used music in my game 
and uh, it came to a point where the music for the the Void Knights for the Cult of Osmodio was Electric Wizard, which is like a doom metal band. So every time they heard the music switch to a, some like droning doom metal, they knew that things were about to get bad, and they were about to encounter these arch nemesis that they had created called the Void Knights. And so, um, and these guys, like again, were just like evil paladins to this evil uh, god of the void. So you got to have room for that kind of stuff. Um, are there any guilds in your world? Are there magic guilds? Are there thieve guilds? Are there organizations for fighters and, and uh, mercenary groups? Are there things like that that the players can join or start? You want to have that option. Players are going to be really interested because then that gives them something kind of tangible to invest in in the world that you've created. So that's also super important. And then maybe you want to have some pre-generated uh, treasures in your world. Things that maybe you specifically want your players to have based on their class and you think it'd be really cool for them to have. Maybe you want to consider making some items or relics that are uh, that, that your players would like. Look at my notes here. The last half of this video, I wanted to talk about improvising and why it is that Basic Fantasy is going to be the system of choice for me for a sandbox game and why uh, improvising is going to be a lot more interesting to me. So, Basic Fantasy has uh, encounter tables. So, if you look here, in Basic Fantasy book on page 144, they have uh, rolls that you can make on, you know, a d12 or a d20 or two d6s or something like that, where you have different encounters. And I'll, I'll actually put it up on the screen here because the beauty, the beauty of this system is it's free. You can buy the books at cost, or you can download the PDFs from the Basic Fantasy website for free. All everything they've made for this system is free, which is why this is like, this is amazing. But, you know, they have uh, tables that you can roll on for um, uh, encounters in a dungeon, and then they're based on level, or in the wilderness, or and, and in various kinds of world wildernesses here. So, uh, deserts, grasslands, mountains, oceans, uh, and then you also have town and village ones, where they can encounter things like doppelgangers, thieves, the city watch, you know, some mercenaries, a, a werewolf or were rat. Generally, were rats are in cities. And the beauty of it, so you, you'd roll on this table. First, first, let's say you'd roll uh, for encounters, if they're going to occur or not. It says here in the in the dungeon encounters, on a, a roll of one on a d6, the game master should check uh, every every turn with that, every three turns to see if an encounter occurs in a dungeon. So it means roaming monsters. In the wilderness, it's a, also a 1 on a d6. And I believe in cities, it's a, um, a roll 2d6. Uh, it doesn't say here, but I'm assuming you could probably do the, the same thing there. But the beauty of it, so you, let's say you're in the dungeon. You roll your d12, and you're like, ah, they're level one. They run into some kobolds here, which is number four on the die roll here. So they run into some kobolds. You can go to the kobold, kobold on uh, the, the book here. And the beauty of the kobolds here is that they ha give you really simple stats. Again, I've talked about that before. Really simple stats. And um, it tells you the number of appearing. Uh, so 44, or in the wild, it's 60-10, or in a lair, it's 60-10. So we're in, a, maybe it's the kobold's la lair, so we roll 60-10, whatever roll we get, let's say it's it's 8 kobold, or let's, let's say it's uh, 10, let's 10 kobold. 10 co we roll 10, 10 kobold appear, and the party has to fight this now. Really quick, really easy. Um, way of doing that. So, after that, like, how, where is this encounter taking place in your dungeon? And I think in a sandbox game, it's really important to have uh, some kind of way to generate dungeons on the fly. Fifth edition rulebook allows you to kind of like roll dice to kind of figure out where things are going, and you can use that if you wish. The fifth edition rulebook is really great on that. 
or uh, you can use uh, I just use dungeon map generator on my phone you can set up uh, a lot of different ways of doing it so you can do the dungeon size let's say you want a large dun dungeon you want the difficulty to be medium party levels let's say their first level and how many people in the party for treasure value standard and item max rarity uncommon there's all these things you can set room density low let's let's make the rooms bigger let's say it's like medium and uh, or low meat but room size is medium and you can say whether you want traps dead ends corridors and all these sorts of things I think it's focused on fifth but what I'm interested in is just randomly creating a dungeon from scratch for me you generate the dungeon and it makes a little dungeon map for you and if you're using like a dry erase uh, battle map you can start drawing out your dungeon as the players adventure through it or you can you can use graph paper if you wish as well super easy just finding a way to auto generate dungeons because here's gonna this is gonna be the thing you're gonna be making you're gonna be improvising and making things up on the fly and so you want players to maybe randomly discover a cave and then this is a cave you didn't plan uh, what's in this cave you got the monsters you got treasure tables in here as well you got random dungeon generation so you can go into a game with very little prep maybe just the setting and walk away with actually I think a pretty fun game so this is why I'm switching to basic fantasy I'm gonna be leaving fifth edition because I I like the old school vibe with a lot of this one thing I forgot to mention too with uh, the dungeon uh, with the monsters here is reaction tables so if we go here to the beginning um, let's see monster reactions so they give you a reaction table here <coughs> and this is interesting because on a two or less monsters immediately attack on a three to seven um, and you'd roll 2d6 for this on a three to seven they're unfavorable but they're not going to outright attack 8 to 11 is favorable. Uh, favorable doesn't mean they, that the goblins want to be the PC's friends, but favorable might mean that they're more willing to negotiate instead of just recklessly die for some stupid cause. Maybe they're willing to uh, get the PC's like, look, we'll leave you alone or we'll give you this treasure that we have if you kill the troll in the next room that we hate. 12 or more, very favorable. So they're very, they're very willing to uh, negotiate maybe with the players. This is super helpful uh, because this adds variety to the game as well. As, as a, the player characters are maybe rolling through the dungeon and they encounter uh, a bandit NPC party and you roll and the, the bandits are very favorable because they've been in this dungeon and then this is how you role play it. You kind of work backwards. You've rolled, a, you've, you've rolled a random encounter. Okay, the party's going to encounter bandits in this cave room. Uh, what, how do the bandits react to the players? They're very favorable. You roll your dice, very favorable. Okay, now you can in your head improvise and say things like, well, okay, maybe the bandits have been trapped in this dungeon for a very long time. So yes, they're scum. Yes, they're villains. But they see non-monsters approaching them. And so they're just like, thank God. We're willing to work with you in order to get out of here. And maybe we'll, uh, we'll show you where we hid some treasure if you help us get out of you can create a story on the fly based on all these different random things that you're doing and that's super helpful that's super useful so this is why I'm switching to basic fantasy and to OSR type games uh, they work better for this sort of thing and um, one last thing I think you need as a dungeon master I've shown it a little bit already is a notebook uh, to plan your adventure in and this is where I just have like custom creatures that I've made that maybe I want the players to run into. So I made, like, for instance, uh, stats in the basic fantasy way for specific, like, cultists that I want to have the players encounter. What are their stats? So, like, the initiates, the acolytes. Um, that's where I have, again, my map. I have information on uh, organizations that maybe I want the players to run into. Um, just look, quick little, and it, they're just like little bullet point things. They're not anything uh, important here. 
This is a little something I wanted time to be an important uh, thing in my game world. And so I have a calendar here that just pretty much uses like the Druidic Celtic calendar, which is a 13 month, 28 day calendar. And I, I picked a specific uh, date and month uh, for my game to start on. And then I can keep track of time that way. Which kind of makes it cool. It kind of adds story elements where maybe players enter a settlement and I can say, it's this date and there's a festival going on and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What are the days of the week? Because I didn't want to just use Monday because I'm keeping track of time in this game world. So, um, what are the days of the week? I didn't want to just say it's Thursday in my fantasy world. Every day has to have an interesting day. So, uh... I uh, have various days of the week here, and this is something you don't have to do. You can get away without this. I just thought this would add extra flavor. It's just an extra thing for me to keep track of as a dungeon master. I don't recommend everyone does it, especially if you already already have a lot on your plate. And then obviously, I have like some hand-drawn dungeons that I did myself, and uh, you know, so various ones here. And I have a big dungeon here that I was working on here where, you know, I'm just like trying to plan. These are, these are, this dungeon broke, broke, uh, breaks my rule of don't make dungeons that are mass, too massive and big. But, uh, I just thought it'd be fun to have at least one or two prepared, um, big dungeons. I'm not going to do a lot because again, I'm going to maybe rely a little bit more on random dungeon generation over, um, filling this up with dungeons that I may never use. It's just a waste of time and preparation when I could be preparing other things or uh, whatever it is. Maybe just enjoying life instead of d making dungeon mastering a full-time job that you're not paid. You don't want to do that. You're going to get burned out of dungeon mastering very quick. Unless it's something you really, really love. Anyways, I think that's going to do it. So, kind of to recap... Things to avoid. Make the story as simple as possible, uh, and then build up on it from there. There's going to be your players. I guarantee you're going to give you plenty of things to to play off of in order to make the story more complex and more interesting. And the players are going to feel that they're contributing to the world and changing it if you allow that to happen. Uh, avoid overly complex politics unless your players know they're getting into that. Um, useless world building details. If, if the players are never going to encounter that fact, think about it. If they're never going to encounter that, there's no point in it. Unless you really enjoy world building and you really want to know the population of this town that they're going to visit, there's no... It's your game world. It's your preparation. Do what you want, but uh, it's not 100% necessarily necessary. And then overly complex dungeons. Again, I'm going to be relying more on auto-generation. And I can... If I don't like the layout that it gives me, I can just keep generating dungeons here, you know, until, oh, you know, I like that. And then I can insert stairs somewhere over here and uh, generate a new dungeon and like, oh, here's another floor. So you can actually get extremely complex dungeons, but with zero prep time. So that's the beauty of it. And then you can roll for random monster encounters in various places, and there you go. So, my whole point with this video is to explain to you guys that there's a lot that you can do with very little prep. Sandbox, specifically for a sandbox game, with very little prep. And uh, your players, I think, will still have a good time. And they're going to think, they're going to think that... Uh, you put in all this effort and time, and really, you didn't really put that much. Um, you're relying on your improvisational skills, which I think is the most important skill to have as a dungeon master. Because again, you make this perfect story, you make this perfect world and this perfect adventure for the players to experience, and they're going to either avoid certain things, break certain things, find plot holes in what you're doing, or uh, just they're not going to think it's as cool as you think it is. That, that's also a possibility, a distinct possibility. But you avoid any of that, I think, when you allow the players to kind of contribute to the world. And even if there are plot holes, 
they might not notice it as much because they were a part of creating it and so they're going to have a little more attachment to it maybe so anyways I hope this video was helpful of things to avoid, things to look to, and some various tools that you can use to run your basic fantasy RPG. This is what, how I'm going to do it if, if I do this. It's funny because basic fantasy, the basic fantasy game I'm going to run is going to be definitely more sandbox. Here's the world. Go have fun with it. We'll make it up as we go along. Whereas a Call of Cthulhu game is obviously going to be more structured, more kind of railroaded. Uh, railroad like because it kind of has to be for a game like that so it's like two opposite things so it comes down to what what do I feel like experiencing at that point is it going to be a sandbox old school game uh, a fantasy game or some horror and an investigation and really heavy role play so I'm not sure but uh, like I said every day I swing back and forth between basic fantasy and call of Cthulhu for my next game after adventures in middle earth which I'll say I'm going to make some uh, journals explaining our adventures in Middle Earth game and kind of what's happened, where we're at, and I'm going to try and do some uh, journals as we play. We play every other week, uh, so we'll, we'll see. Um, we'll see how that, that goes. Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Again, I hope it was helpful, useful, and I hope you have a good time playing your games out there. Keep rolling 20s. I'll catch you guys in the next video.